uh, another part, part three, with Colonel Dave Grossman. And now we're going to be discussing about what do we need to prepare for when our mind and body responds to life and death, death events. You. you know, that, this, again, we're, we're kind of working on the basics. You know, I, I took a lot of shooting classes, and you go to the advanced class, and they said the advanced class is the basics master. You know, the martial arts, there are no so cool, you know, things that they're just a basics master. A lot of people talk about a training cycle, you know, individual training, group training, break, you know, but you really should think of it as a spiral staircase. You can go through the same cycle at a higher level every time. And we need to be ready. These, these are terribly frightening times. Uh, I, I, I believe what's coming down the road is, uh, is far worse than what we're seeing right now. We're going to see daycare massacres. We're going to see school bus massacres. I pray that I'm wrong. Uh, China's had repeated daycare massacres and repeated school bus massacres. I like using this from the Associated Press and about an attack in China on a school. An attacker killed eight students, injured two others. How? Did he shoot them? Did he run over them? Did he, did he, did he poison them? They don't want to say it because he did it with a knife. You're in America, you know, it's all about the guns, baby. And, if, and we just, you know, it, it can't happen in China because they got all those gun laws, right? There's another one. They say April last year, nine were killed, more than a dozen injured outside of middle school. How? <laughs> they don't want to say it. He did it with a knife. And just understand that worldwide terrible crimes are happening and we need to be ready. You know, Russia had its own college massacre. Russia had its Virginia Tech and nobody in America even heard about it. It's only happening in America. No, it's not around the world. We got to worry about these college massacres. And in Italy, this is a crazy one. A little over a year ago, a bus driver in Italy hijacked a bus load of 51 kids, soaked it with gas and set it off with 51 kids on board. Best I can tell, the Italians were brilliant on this. They had a roadblock and they had fire trucks everywhere. They hammered this, uh, this bus full of children, soaked with gasoline, torched off. Uh, not a single kid died. Many badly burned, not a single kid died. I tell Americans, that's, that's a European bus with low windows there. An American bus, you're gonna have to drive your vehicle next to it, stand on the roof, break windows and yank kids out of the windows. But Fire Department New York, FDNY, Six months after this incident, I trained Fire Department New York, and they had the chief of their counterterrorism division, and he didn't even know about this incident. This major incident happens in England. Here in America, the head of FDNY's counterterrorism, they never heard of it. So these things are happening all around us, and the point is that we need our sheepdogs. Now, there's evil in this world, and, and then there's, there's the sheep, the innocent, and then there's a sheepdog who dedicate themselves for, to protecting the innocent. And one of the things about us as sheepdogs, as protectors, is we've mastered this realm of combat through training, through stress inoculation, through preparation. We're, we're prepared for these life and death events. So I want to show you kind of a, an angle on what's happening to a human being in a life and death event. And uh, you know, we, we're going to start with, uh, with the brain. The part of the brain we're going to call the forebrain. Inside the forebrain goes everything that makes us human. What are the things that happen in your head never happen in your dog's head? Let's call it rational thought. Like it's the forebrain, part of the brain is going to call the midbrain or the mammalian brain. Just get you oriented, here's your little beady bloodshot eye looking out this way. Inside the midbrain goes everything every living creature has in common. What do you, your dog, and the bacteria in your body have in common? Well, forgive me, there's a joke. There's a classic old joke in this 1950 psychophysiology textbook, Regis on a modern textbook, that a function of the midbrain can be thought of as the four Fs. The four Fs are fight, flee, uh, 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 food, and reproduction. Every living creature is capable of these four things. Fight or flight, take in energy, and reproduce. So here's the key. When we become angry, when we become frightened, the forebrain shuts down. There's no rational thought. And the part of the brain, same as your dog, reaches up and hijacks the forebrain. You cannot have a rational conversation with a frightened or angry person. Because there's nobody home. You're trying to argue with their dog through the mail slot. I want to give you a photo here to make this come alive. This is uh, two individuals coming down for the World Trade Center on 
Now her face is beet red. His face is bone white. He's on his second trip down for the World Trade Center. He's uh, on the other side of the head, pretty bad cut. He's been, he's been burned. A second trip down for the World Trade Center. She has experienced what we call vasodilation. Her face is beet red. We've all seen that after her exercise. His heart rate could be exactly the same. The impact on his body is exactly the opposite. He's experiencing vasoconstriction. So in a life and death threat situation, uh, the body can, can go into overdrive like her and get tomato face. But when you get that, that white face, don't worry so much about this red with rage. You watch out for the one that's white with rage. Very often you see across the eyes, sometimes called the mask of fear. When the whole face goes white, watch out. So what we're talking about is, is, is not exercise-induced heart rate. It's fear or hormonal-induced heart rate. And, and the shutdown of that forebrain, and there's no rational thought of that person's head. And, and, and you'll give another angle on this to wrap ourselves together. We're going to take two models here. I was a West Point psych professor. I'm not a graduate of West Point. Uh, came up through the ranks, OCS, but I love West Point. Amazing place. And the top psych minds, the top military minds, put their heads together. What do we want every West Point officer to know about this psychology stuff? And it really kind of starts with this the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And we tell the West Point cadets, we said, think of your body like a military unit. These are the guys in the front lines with the rifle. And this is fight or flight. These are all of the cooks and clerks and bakers and mechanics. These are the maintenance folks, often called rest and digest. Also called feed and breed. We're back to that fourth F. We'll come back to that. Fight or flight, feed and breed, right? Fight or flight, feed and breed. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. And we'll tell our cadets, when you're, when you're asleep, your unit's on stand down. There's not a guard at the front gate. You're in maintenance mode. You wake up in the morning, and you have what we call homeostasis. So that guy's in front lines with the rifle, got your folks doing your maintenance, Back to bed that night, wake up in the morning, rocking along, and somebody tries to kill you. Boom! Total sympathetic nervous system arousal. Digestion? We don't need no stinking digestion. Blow the ballast. Further you go up here, further you come down there. Napoleon said the moment of greatest vulnerability is immediately after victory. Think about that. The moment of greatest vulnerability is immediately after victory. Why? You let your guard down. But it's more than just letting your guard down. It's a physiological crash, and you can't get back up again. How do we prevent uh, people in life and death events from crashing? Train all the way through. You're in the video scenario. The bad guy's down. We're not done. Provide first aid. Call for backup. Let's secure evidence. Find witnesses and get them right there, right there. Critical time to do is any witnesses there, get their name, have them stay there, and, and collect their information. You're not done. The SWAT team sweeps through the objective. We're not done. Bad guy can pop in the back door any time. Provide 360 security. Provide first aid. Reallocate resources, uh, liquids, ammo, casualties, equipment. We're not done. Train all the way through. But in a nutshell now, this is the critical part. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is when you see something, you hear something, and then go on that roller coaster ride again. The path to healing is to remember it without reliving it. Now, when you re-experience the event, a, a gunshot goes off, a week later, your heart is pounding, that is not PTSD. It's normal. It can become PTSD depending how you respond to it. And the worst thing you can do is trying to not think about it. You will literally drive yourself crazy trying to not think about it. You gotta make peace with the memory, separate the memory from the emotions. Now, one of the tools that we use to leash in the puppy, and this is their puppy, and the leash on the puppy is your breathing exercise. I'm gonna teach you the breathing right now. It's the most important tool I can give you. 
I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of case studies. People have emailed me, written me, and, and I organize those case studies by topic. Of all the topics, the biggest folder is the breathing. The breathing saves lives and has an impact on lives. And if I could just give you one little survival skill, the breathing is the skill I want you to have. Now, a lot of us know Cooper's uh, code, you know, where condition yellow, you know, condition red, condition black. What I tell people is our enemy is condition white, which is denial. We want to live our lives in condition yellow, just readiness. Keep your back to the wall, be alert to what's going on, carry the life-saving tools of your profession when it's legal, uh, and, and just live your life in condition yellow. The bad stuff comes, you're not stunned. But if you live your life in condition white and something comes by, boom, you're stunned, you're overwhelmed, and you go on that roller coaster ride there. So we'll talk in a minute how we prevent that roller coaster ride. But what I want to talk about now is how we separate the memory from the emotions. And the breathing is a tool that we're going to use. Again, of all the, all the responses I got, the breathing has saved the most lives, had the greatest impact. I had a, just two weeks ago, cops sent me an email after a deadly force incident, he said, don't anybody try to tell you that combat breathing doesn't work. You can hear me doing it on the microphone, and it worked. I'll give you a couple of crazy examples I've gotten. Uh, a, uh, a, a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, he said he, he's kind of shaking off some cobwebs, he's up doing some mountain climbing, some outward bound stuff, kind of getting his head right. He's, in a, he's, he's with a team climbing a mountain, in the middle of the night, he wakes up. They're on the top of this glacier, this slick, slick glacier where they they got a camp for the night. So I wake up in the night and I'm completely disoriented. And I'm wandering around without traction devices on this slick glacier and, and I'm completely disoriented. And I heard your voice say, breathe. In through the nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Out for the lips, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. I regained control and I realized I was just a step away from stepping off a cliff and being dead. Uh, another example, a, a, a guy and his wife had listened to the audio of my book. All my books I'd done the narration on and, and they'd listened to the audio of on combat. And so his wife had a medical emergency and she's literally hovering at death's door. She's just life and death. She's got a tube down her throat. She can't breathe. She's hacking. And, 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 and barely maintaining control, and she scrawls on a piece of paper, Grossman, breathing. Her husband knew exactly what he was saying. He said, I began to coach her. In through the nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Out through the lips, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. She regained control and literally saved her life. So let me teach you the breathing right now. And if you're gonna walk away with just one little survival skill, that I'm gonna give you some great forewarn, forearm type information and leashing in the puppy. I'm going to talk about a swig of water doing the same thing as breathe them. You don't always have water. You can always stop and breathe. What we're going to do is this now. We're going to do three breaths. We're going to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. For years, people say, well, why in through the nose? Because that's what seems to work. Well, a little while back, there was a major medical study that said when you breathe in through the, it doesn't have to be through the nose but it can be far more effective. When you breathe in through the nose, the body processes it differently. So we're gonna breathe in through the nose, hold for four count, out through the lips, hold for four count again and again. A Couple of key things. Keep your eyes open. This is combat breathing. A lot of people, we have what we call a training scar. They've been taught breathing, they're taught to close their eyes. And so we see people in our force and force engagement, you know, they, Close your eyes and take a breath. That's a training scar. You're not going to close your eyes. Keep your eyes open. And I'll tell you, I'll have an audience of 100 people. I tell them that. There'll be one or two with their eyes closed every time. Keep those eyes open. Number two, don't roll your head back like this. You're not going to do that life and death event. But what you are going to do is unscrew the natural stress. A newborn baby has that response. Head goes down, hands come up, pull the head back. Pull the shoulders back. And when you breathe... Fill the lungs completely full. To fill the lungs completely full, you've got to relax the stomach and let the diaphragm push it out of the way. Let that old Twinkie tumor just hang out there. Let it just hang out there. You know, kids right to about five years old have that adorable little pot belly. Right about five years old in our culture, 
they learn to suck it up. And that's really not healthy. The healthy thing to do is when you breathe in, the stomach goes out. You breathe out, the stomach relaxes. Okay, so we're going to do three breaths now. Eyes open, head back, shoulders back, fill the lungs completely full. Here we go. In through the nose, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Out through the lips, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. In through the nose, deep, deep, deep. Hold, two, three, four. Out through the lips, deep, deep, deep. Hold, two, three, four. Simple exercise in a true revolution. John, they're teaching us the little kids. I'm talking three years old. How they teach the little ones, I did with my grandkids. The docs had a scented plastic flower. I went outside and just plucked a flower with my grandkids. And the docs got a candle. The doc lights the candle and models the behavior. Smell in the flower. Enjoy it. Blow out the candle. Watch the smoke. Now you do it. That fast, you got a three-year-old breathing on command. And it really works. They control anxiety and responses. It just pulls them right out of it. They control test anxiety. Test, you want to take a test and condition yellow. As your heart rate goes up, you know what we call condition red, which is a nice place to be in a life and death event. But for taking a test, you want to be in condition yellow. And the breathing is a tool to teach people to bring it under control. So that, uh, the breathing is always there. But in recent years, we've discovered that you can do the same thing, more so by having them take a drink of water. Taking a drink of water is a natural way to make people breathe. But it also has a powerful impact on the body. We go from sympathetic to parasympathetic. Go from fight or flight to rest and digest. In a lot of cultures, when somebody's upset, they hand them a glass of water. And that, or maybe a, a stiff drink. It's not the whiskey that's doing it in that stiff drink. It's the act of swallowing. I, I tell cops on a high-speed pursuit, if you key the mic, and you hear Mickey Mouse come over the radio, you know you got a problem. If you can't control your voice, you can't control your... If, if, if you hear that stress in your voice on the radio, yeah. that means you're up here in condition red. You've lost fine motor control. Yeah. And so a cop sends me an email. He said, Dave, I'm on a high-speed pursuit. I key the mic, just like you said. I heard Mickey Mouse come over the radio. Had a bottle of water there. Took a swig of water, key the mic. <clears throat> Fighter pilot comes over the radio from that point on. So when we, when we talk to people about the life and death event, if they go on that roller coaster ride again, all we're doing is reinforcing the link between the memory and the emotions. The path to healing is to talk about the event and not have the emotions come along for a ride. And then what I used for decades was to have people stop and breathe. Today, we have them stop and take a swig of water. A friend of mine is one of our nation's leading therapists for federal agents after life and death events. And she told me about how she's used this bottle of water and what an incredible impact this had. She said she's had 14 years of practice, six years of college, and that stupid bottle of water is doing more good than I've ever done. So we'll take it a step further now. I, I trained a major spec ops unit, and, uh, and my host was a master sergeant. His wife was an emergency room psychiatrist. And she told him about something sweeping through the emergency rooms worldwide. You got a crackhead or a meth head tearing up the ER. You know what they do? The emergency room nurse, they take a bag of M&Ms. They rip it open. They shovel his face. Would you like some M&Ms? And completely defuse the situation. Now, this guy's a spec ops, you know, multiple combat tours, high-level spec ops. He said, I just blew it off. Yeah, sure, sure. Blew it off. This kind of guy in America carries a gun off duty kind of guy you want to. He said, two different times, my wife and I are in bad trouble. I think I'm going to have to draw my gun and fight for our lives. Both times, he said, my wife reaches in her purse, pulls out a bag of M&Ms, rips it open, shoves the guy's face, would you like some M&Ms, and completely defuse the situation. He said, now, it's one thing when a pretty girl does it. <laughs> I'm still not so sure. You know, I could have plan B back here. 
But take it one step further. This is cutting edge stuff. You know, swig of water, you know, eating to regain, you know, rest and digest. So uh, a cop came up to me during a break in a presentation and he brought his partner with him to vouch. Such a wild story. He brought his partner to vouch for the story. Naked guy in the front yard screaming and throwing things inarticulately. And the parents on the porch, don't shoot our kid, don't shoot our kid. Naked guys usually mean something's wrong. Very often what you're looking at is called excited delirium. Their body goes into overdrive. They're capable of great feats of strength. And there's no rational thought. And, 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 and the reason they're naked is because they're hot. If you have a naked guy die on you, you have the docs take a temperature. If that guy's running a temp, something happened and you didn't do it. So was it excited delirium? We don't know. It meets everything that we could know in the definition. And the cop said, what the hell are we supposed to do? And then he said, I happen to have a Snickers bar in my hand. I thought, what the hell? I said, hey, buddy, you want a Snickers bar? Huh? You want a Snickers bar? Huh? You know, walked right up to him, put it in his face. Would you like a Snickers bar? Yeah. Following you up to your room, I'll give it to you. Let him know the room, gave a sticker bar, walked away. Was it excited delirium? Would it work again? We don't know. It's one of those what he got to lose kind of things. Just understand that we're truly pulling somebody from fight or flight to rest and digest. From fight or flight to feed and breed. And so here's an important point. After a life and death event, a lot of people gorge themselves, which is a good thing. And a lot of people victims of crime, uh, first responders in life and death event, a lot of people go home and have some really intense sex. And it scares people. A victim of a crime or in this life and death event, and now that this, 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 scares people. What I tell people is there's, there's nothing wrong if it doesn't happen. There's nothing wrong if it does happen. It's really kind of a beautiful grasping for affirmation of life in the face of death. It's a hormonal surge. But it scares people, and I tell them, you know, not a whole lot of perks that come with this lifestyle. You find one, relax, and enjoy it. Off duty, wait till you're off duty. You'll still be there, I promise. So this 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 dynamic of, of sympathetic and parasympathetic backlash. How do, how do we not go on that roller coaster ride? And there's one last thing I want to tell you. We truly are fight or flight, and rest and digest is just set aside, and very often. People mess themselves and wet themselves. One major study on World War II, major study on World War II, approximately 20% of the veterans of intense combat in World War II would admit they wet them, they mess themselves one time or another. About half of the veterans of intense combat would admit they wet themselves. So roughly 20% would admit they mess themselves. About half would admit that they wet themselves. One old Vietnam, one old World War II vet told me, hell, all that proves. 80% were liars. <laughs> we, we, we don't know what percent were lying. We know at least one out of five would admit it happened. Maybe others, they wouldn't admit it. But it is a natural human response. And, and it's more than just redirecting energy. It's getting toxic matter out of your body. The Greeks used to say your bowels turn to water. And, and the stress diarrhea, very common. And people are devastated by it. Again, I teach medical responders and ER people, and I, what ratio of traffic accident victims have messed themselves? Numbers all over the map, but it's very high. And people are devastated, lifelong, humiliated, devastated. And a little psychological first aid goes a long way. That's your body's natural response. It happens all the time. Don't worry about it. You can literally save somebody from shame and despair by saying that's your body's natural response. Happens all the time. So I, I was training a, an emergency room, uh, training all the ER, and I talked about this physiological response. And one of the nurses, face gets red, her eyes are welling up. I thought, wow, something's going on here. During the break, she came up to me. This nurse said, I, I want to tell you my secret. What? So one day in the operating room, I wet myself. That's it? Yes. Yeah, for her, she was devastated. She said, I'm a nurse. I know what happens all the time. It never occurred to me that it could happen to me. And it's okay. We're all human. And so this, this roller coaster ride, but one of the things that's happening 
is inside every human body is a toxic waste site. It's called the colon. Think of it like one of those big long balloons full of shit. And if it gets nipped, that stuff will leak out and infect the wound. Prior to modern medication, you're dead. So the body dumps that toxic waste. Isn't that brilliant? And, and you go from a balloon full of toxic waste to an empty balloon. The target is smaller and, and, and you've gotten rid of that toxic waste. Is that not an amazing survival mechanism? So how do we prevent it from happening? We can all agree we'd really rather not have it happen. How do we prevent it? Stress inoculation. Inoculate. One of the most important things we can do is to do realistic simulations of what we're actually going to face and get inoculated. Firefighters have to face well burning alley fire in training. We face well burning alley bullets. One of the greatest revolutions on the battlefield uh, since the invention of gunpowder is our force on force simulation type stuff. Paintball's good, airsoft is good, the gold standard, you got a real gun in your hand, you pull the trigger, flash it a bang, what leaves a barrel is not a chunk of lead, but a plastic marking capsule. Leaves a barrel at 350, 400 feet per second. If it hits you in the hand, does it hurt? That's good. Pain is good. Firefighters got a face roll burning. You fire, we face roll burning, how we bullets. So NYPD, 35,000 gun toters. NYPD puts this force on force scenario-based training in place. In the following year, they fire half as many shots and get three times as many hits. Now an N of 35,000, half as many shots, three times as many hits. Today, the state of New York says you are negligent to give anybody a gun and not do these force on force scenarios. Uh, uh, NYPD's academy was always 40 hours of firearms training. That was my academy. It's kind of the national standard, 40 hours of firearms training. Today, NYPD academy is 80 hours of firearms training. And the additional 40 hours all are for some force scenarios. Now remember, this scenario doesn't just involve hitting the target. It involves providing first aid. It pro involves securing the evidence. It involves finding witnesses and, and getting statements and getting them to have them stay and get their information. And, and so this dynamic of these force on force engagements in that second 40 hour block, they're integrating everything together. Report writing and, and, and what actions when the bad guy's down and all the other stuff that you got to do. They integrate this in, the, in together. But I want to give you a case study to make it come alive. Orlando, Florida. A mom parks her minivan in the garage, leaves two little kids in the van, goes in the house. Armed home evaders take mom hostage. One of the kids in the van takes mom's cell phone from her purse in the van, dials 911, gives her address, said bad guy's got my mommy's. Cops are responding, and one of the first responders was Deputy Jennifer Fulford. Now, Jennifer Fulford told me, she said, if RoboCop shoves his head in a van, says, come with me, kids, you peel them off the ceiling. She said, one of our female warriors says, come with me, kids, there's a good chance they will. It's just something we can bring to the table that the guys can't. And Jennifer Fulford said, I'll go in the garage and get the kids. As she goes in the garage from one direction, Three armed home evaders come in the garage from the other direction. In the gunfight that follows, Deputy Jennifer Fulford will be shot 10 times. Three bullets are shot by body armor equipment. Seven bullets punch through her body. Early in the gunfight, her right arm is disabled by a bullet. Drops a gun in the right hand, picks her left hand, and kills the SOB that shot her. It's only fair. Non-dominant hand, one-handed, precise second fire, game over. While the other one's sinking slugs in her, Jennifer does a left-handed, one-handed reload under fire and kills the second one. Third one, Miser runs like a leader surrenders. Jennifer shot the bits. Seven bullets punched her body, both legs pretty much disabled, propped against the wall, one arm disabled, got about one functioning limb, two bleeding out, dying bad guys, screaming kids, gun smoke, shell case, and the whole thing, seconds. Another cop comes racing in, second minor said, Jennifer, are you okay? She said, I'm like, no, get me out of here. Six months later, Jennifer Fulford was married. She said she's a glutton for punishment. One year later, she was back on the department, fully recovered, back on the job. Now, how do you do that? Precise, accurate fire, left-handed, one had little to fire. Well, Jennifer was in my class a year after the incident, fully recovered, back on the job. And we all know about the gunfight of the OK Corral and Wyatt Earp. How Wyatt Earp needed Doc Holliday and two brothers to take out three bad guys at the OK Corral. 
Deputy Jennifer Fulford did it all by herself. Like most heroes, she's very humble, got a very important point. She said, I am a product of my training. We did our paintball at force on force training. I was hit and hit and hit and it hurt. My trainer said, don't you stop. We don't give you permission to die. We don't train you to fail. Keep going. They drill me, drill me, and take your bullets and drive it on. They drill me, drill me, a left hand and one hand reloads. And here's the magic words. She said, when the real thing happened, it was less stressful than the first time I did it in training. That's the definition of stress inoculation. When the real thing happened, it was less stressful than the first time I did it in training. So what I want to do is uh, just, we've hit the point where the goal is to forewarn and forearm about the things that are happening and training to, to drive on through the process. And one of the dynamics is to live a life as a quiet professional. Today we talk about the quiet professional, but we've heard about it throughout history. The laconic Spartan, the stoic Roman, the inscrutable samurai, the stiff upper lip Brit, and the day we talk about the quiet professional. There are all different ways of saying the same thing, self-control. It's all about self-control. Nobody respects our temper tantrum. Nobody respects it when we blow our cool. As leaders, we must mimic and model the quiet professional. So we're all human. If we blow our cool and start screaming and shouting, just understand nobody respects that. They respect our calm. We try to do a better job the next time. If the day-to-day -day pissant things make us blow our cool, the day-to-day -day things make us then the screaming, ranting fools, when people are dying and things are going to hell, there's no way you're going to be able to remain calm. And so we, we nurture this environment of quiet professionals. We've all had leaders that screamed at us and we despise them. Don't be that person. And, and in basic training in all the armed forces, the drill sergeant gets in your face and shouts at you. It's a form of stress inoculation, intentionally used in that one circumstance. You think the drill sergeant goes to normal, you know, they're out of control. No, they're the last ones to do that because they know it's a game that we play in one specific circumstance. So we try to live our lives in condition yellow and, and live our lives in a state of readiness. And when we blow our cool, we, we know we made a mistake, try to do a better job the next time. Well, one of the best things we can do is forewarn you and forearm you about what's going to happen to your body. Now, everything I'm telling you is out of On Combat. I recommend it very highly. This is on page 55 in On Combat. Perceptual distortions in combat. Dr. Alexis Artwell is a police psychologist in Portland, Oregon, and she surveyed uh, 140 cops about their experiences in a life and death event. 85% the shots got muted. Stop there. 85% and everybody, uh, hunters tell you that when they're hunting, they don't hear the shot or the shots are muted. How could we have had 500 years of gunfighter combat and not let people know that shots get muted? Ever think about that. So 85% had diminished sound, but look, 16% had intensified sounds. Even old Buck Sergeant from Arkansas figured out that adds up to 101%. Sometimes both happens. Every time I've ever heard it, it went like this. You're caught by surprise in an ambush. Boom, 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 shots overwhelming. You start shooting back, the shots get muted. The body will focus intensely on the sense it needs most for survival. When you start shooting back, the eyes dial in and the ears dial out. Now you are still getting hearing loss. The shutouts in the nerve, the ear is still being hammered. So this, this, uh, this diminished sound, auditory exclusion, tunnel vision, 80% experience tunnel vision. Now, bad guys have tunnel vision too, and lateral movement can take you right off their radar screen. Now, I, I, I like to shoot, and, and I like to train people to shoot. Uh, I grew up in the martial arts. I love the martial arts. I love the dojo and the structure. I turned 18. I enlisted in the Army. My martial art became the rifle and the pistol. For years, I've heard of a guy that had the martial art of the firearm. Hujitsu. He reinvented the Japanese martial art of the firearm. Uh, www.hujitsu.com. Hotel Oscar Juliet Uniform Tango Sierra Uniform.com. And I thought I was good. I showed up for the first three day weekend and made brown belt by the skin of my teeth. I trained for two years to make my black belt. I knew what shots I was missing. I knew what time hacks I was missing. You know, in America, we don't have bowling leagues or shooting teams anymore. They're, they're just not into that. 
But 20 million Americans are the martial arts and striving for the next belt, striving for that next standard. We can wrap our mind around that. So I trained for two years, got my black belt, and now I, uh, I'm able to do some teaching. And I tell people that every draw should have a side step built into it. We'll go back to tunnel vision. Bad guys have tunnel vision too. And a lateral movement can take you right off their radar screen. When we do our force on force engagements, it's not kill or be killed, it's hurt or be hurt. A lot of people, when they do it the first time, their body treats it like it's real. And the people are the role players, and people are playing the bad guys in these scenarios. They have found they can do a sidestep and come right off their radar screen. So bad guys have tunnel vision too. And lateral movement take you right off their radar screen. And every draw should have a sidestep built in. To not not sidestep when your draw should be the exception. If you're not armed, you know, I'm, I'm in airports all the time. We had a guy in the airport in Florida that opened fire in the baggage area. What do I do? I don't have a gun when I travel like that. But I've got a plan. I, I've got a vest. I'm going to throw the vest, sidestep. I'm going to charge. I'm going to throw the cell phone and sidestep and keep charging. But we can throw a distraction and sidestep and charge and come right off the radar screen. So remember, some of these things apply across the board. Tunnel vision, autopilot. You do not rise to the challenge. You stink the level of your training. Usually holstering, unholstering without conscious thought. Whatever skill it is you need survival needs to be rehearsed over and over again. Heightened visual clarity, slow motion time. I have had hundreds of people tell me they can see the bullet in combat, and it absolutely blows their mind. It's like a airsoft where the bullet's slow enough for you to track your eyes, and on several occasions they could walk up and point where the bullet hit. No way they could have done that, but they weren't tracking their eyes like they said they were. And so we got the slow motion time, and we've got that memory loss. Half of all trained seasoned cops have memory gaps, blackouts. All right, now, 2016, Five cops murdered in Dallas in one incident. Four cops murdered in Baton Rouge. 2016 was the single worst year-over-year -year increase in cops murdered in the history of our nation. Every year, cops have better medical technology, better body armor, better training, better tactics. The only good measure is the year-over-year -year increase in cops murdered. And 2016 was the single worst we've ever had. And we also had bad guys going to the cops' house to murder their family. But mama bear protecting her cubs can be one of the most dangerous things on the planet. The cop's wife, armed with a pistol, killed this guy. And she told me I had absolutely no problem shooting that man who came to hurt my family. She said, what, eat me alive. I heard the audio recording of my 911 call. To this day, I have no memory making that call. It was eat me alive. And then somebody gave me a book and said, look, it's in the book. Half of all trained seasoned cops have it. And she was fine. She went from being eaten up by this to being just fine because she knew it was normal. Psychologists call this normalizing, but it's too trivial a term for something so powerful. So just know that these memory gaps, and one other thing I want to talk about is memory distortions. 22% just flat remembered something that did not happen. You know, it's uh, early in the war, one of our tier one spec ops medics after his first combat tour, came up to me, said, why do the wounded hallucinate so much? Hallucinate, just remember something that did not happen. Just there's something you remember that didn't happen. So th these last two items, memory gaps and memory distortions, but what I want you to understand is the state of Texas has made it the law that the cop has the right to see every video before they'd make their written report. It's the law in Texas, it's common sense everywhere else. The world is gonna hold that person accountable for that video. They got memory gaps, they got memory distortions, they put it on paper, it'll eat your lunch in court. It's only reasonable that they have access to that video before they make their formal statement. Memory gaps and memory distortions. So set aside the fact that somebody's trying to kill you. Set aside the fact somebody's trying to kill you. If you're sitting here right now, boom, Blackouts, hallucinations, that would meet every definition of a psychotic episode. Just those things by themselves would scare the daylights out of you. The fact that somebody's trying to kill you is bad enough. Without your body doing weird and one of the things nobody warned you about, but if they warned they might happen, then they won't bother you. California Highway Patrol officer was in my class. He'd, uh, he'd been forewarned. 
He and his partner in a traffic stop. Bad guy kills his partner. He kills a bad guy and applies CPR on his dead partner. Don't get a whole lot more traumatic than that. But he'd been forewarned. He said, I cannot tell you how important it was in the middle of the gunfight that I know that it was normal for my shots to be muted. He said, tunnel vision like looking through a soda straw. Autopilot, holstering, unholstering, without conscious thought. He said, the slow motion time was real and it was freaky and it was blowing my mind, but I knew it was normal. Memory gaps during the debriefing. We got to do those debriefings afterwards. Today we do the debriefing. Everybody's a bottle of water in front of them. They talk about what happened. They start to become emotional. Take a swig of water and gain control. From the very first time we talk about it, we separate the memory from the emotions. But he said, during the debriefing, people talked about things I didn't remember. Memory gaps. And I was okay with that. And there were one or two things he remembered. And people there said, no, man, that didn't happen. He said, if I didn't know those memory distortions could happen, I would have spent the rest of my life thinking they all conspired to lie to me about some goofy little aspect of what happened. So what we've done is we forewarned you and forearmed you about what happened during the incident. And after the incident, when you go on that roller coaster ride again, you re-experience the event. It's not PTSD, it's normal. But you've got to separate the memory from the emotions. The breathing, the swig of water. These are tools that we can use to get us from that sympathetic and pull us back down into the zone where we want to be. So we covered an awful lot of stuff today and, uh, and, and uh, I, I, I want to continue with anything else you want us to cover, but we, we'll work through a lot of it. You know, one thing is uh, understand that only about 5%, the British troops in Afghanistan, our troops in Afghanistan, the Dutch in Afghanistan, about 5% contract PTSD. And we're darn good at treating PTSD. We get better all the time. And that's an important thing to understand. Faith can be a component of resiliency. My most recent book is on spiritual combat for those that are interested in that angle. And how do we justify chaplains in our armed forces in this day and age? It's just a simple fact that faith can be a factor in resiliency. And well, so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, Dave, you literally read my mind because it's time for that break, that next break. But what I'd like to do after the, the break is come back and talk about faith and talk about, in particular, protecting places of worship as a global concern. So all the viewers, take a break, grab a coffee. We'll be back in five, and uh, look, I look forward to the, the next, uh, the next uh, part of this multi-part episode. So stay tuned for more. Thank you, brother.